Right. Um, so I'm hoping you can all see that. Uh, Jenny, can you just give me some indication? That's what you can see with my first slide. Yes, you're all right. Very good. So, so thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I, now, I actually am from Australia, so I know where Castlemaine is. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've, I've uh, started, uh, I, I think, in my, my career back at CSIRO in 1987, sometime last century, working at CSIRO in Hyatt in Melbourne. And uh, that's my introduction to cheese science. And so I've been working on cheese ever since then. That's about 30, oh, exactly 34 years now. Uh, so don't uh, ask me any questions about seaweed because it's not really my expertise. So I just happened to get some some grant money to work on a seaweed project, but I uh, uh, I think I can picture what seaweed is, but I can't really explain what it is. So <laughs> let's let's stick with dairy products here. Uh, so as Jenny pointed out, I, I work at uh, an institution called Ag Research uh, here in New Zealand, and I've been here for most of the last couple of decades. And uh, I also work at another institution called the Reddit Institute, and this is uh, a, a partnership between Ag Research and Reddit, the Reddit at the Massey University campus in Palmerston North. And there's our, our lovely building there. It's a three-level building with uh, state-of-the-art labs, and it's just finished last year. Uh, we were just about to move in, and we had our, our one lockdown, which was back in, oh gosh, when was it? I guess it was March, no, yeah, March, April last year. That was our... That was our first and only lockdown. So that was a bit of a, a shock to the system, but we did manage to move in all right. And um, it's uh, quite a productive uh, partnership between those two institutions. So I'm a, a cheese structural scientist, physical chemist by training. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what uh, cheese structure is and how it can be uh, manipulated to, uh, to uh, uh, create flavor in cheese products. So let's go ahead and let's see if I can actually change the slide. So these are the most common, a little bit of um, background information here. It's kind of fun to start out with just some introductory dairy uh, chemistry uh, and production. So these are the most common dairy mammals that are found in the world. And as you might expect, uh, the, the, the bovine cow is the most uh, common one with about 84% of milk uh, production worldwide. Uh, the next one is quite surprising. It's a water buffalo. In this case, it looks like the water buffalo might have a glass eye on its left side there. That's a rather, rather interesting picture. And that's a lot of that is due to do with the fact that India produces uh, a large amount of milk of which 60% is, is buffalo. And of course, uh, as I'm sure you all know, mozzarella cheese uh, strictly should be made with, with buffalo milk uh, around the Naples region in Italy. Uh, so the next one is uh, uh, the goat milk, followed by sheep milk, and then followed by camel milk. And I only know of one company, you may know uh, of a few more camel milk companies, one in Saudi Arabia, it's called Camelicious, and they make camel milk yogurt. And it's, it's not that easy to make decent camel uh, milk cheese, but uh, there is a lot of research going on to take the, the chymosin from camels and use that in, in bovine milk uh, cheese manufacture. For various reasons. So starting out uh, 8,000 years ago, which is always a good place to start, uh, first of all, how was cheese developed? It was probably discovered by accident, uh, and the first thing that's required is some kind of mammal, in this case it's probably a sheep, I think, and the next thing you need is to be able to milk it. Then you need some way to clot it, and back 8,000 years ago, there were not a lot of plastic jugs around, so milk would have been stored in something like a stomach. And if it was stored in the, the fourth stomach of a ruminant, uh, then it would have had that clotting agent built into it, uh, chymosin, which would have clotted the milk over time. That's not the only agents you need. Uh, the next one is some kind of agitation to break up the curd structure to introduce what's known as cineresis, uh, followed by some heating, and uh, not that much heat that you can see there in the sun, but something like... Uh, you know, usually between about 38 degrees and 55 degrees, depending upon the type of cheese you're making. And then at the end of the day, uh, the nomad would have undone the stomach and expected to find milk, but would have found curds and whey. So a separation is required at that point uh, to make cheese. So a very rudimentary way to make cheese back then. This is probably how it was uh, serendipitously discovered. So milk uh, and cheese consumption is, is shown here. And I, I try to update this most years when I can get the information. So the latest I got here is 2017. And you'll look at all the countries down there, uh, down to the 13th ranked. And if you look at all of those, where are all those countries? What do they all have in common? I think I've given you a hint there. Where are they located? 
and they're all European countries. And that's where a lot of the, the development has taken place over millennia on uh, cheese, uh, different kinds of cheese varieties. And then you see Australia down there 26th and New Zealand uh, 32nd. And looking at the amount of cheese we consume, it's something like, well, over here, it's just a little less than 10 kgs per year per person. And in Australia, it looks like it's something about 13 kilograms. That's going up, by the way. Up the top there, you'll see that there is um, uh, roughly 655 million tonnes of milk produced per year. And cheese production is, is something like about 21 million tonnes. Right, let's see if we can push this forward. So where is cheese consumed? And, and of course, it's the obvious answer is where it's produced. And if you look at these countries here, uh, the darker the colour, the more cheese that's consumed. And a lot of those countries, uh, the bulk of them appear to either be in Europe, uh, including Russia uh, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, South America, North America, where European immigrants uh, traveled to. Uh, and so that's, that's the history of cheese. And, and because of that, uh, we, we consume cheeses because consumers appreciate it more in, in those countries, although there is a, a growing cheese market in places such as China and, and Japan. So what causes differences in cheese varieties? So it's a number of things there, but first I'd like to point out that cheese only contains four things generally unless it's something else like processed cheese, and that's milk, culture, rennet, and salt, by and large. So things that change the variety of cheese, and you'll see at that upper picture, there's a number of cheese types that I took in a market in Cork in Ireland. And uh, down the bottom there, there's another market. And if you look at, the, look at the printing on that sign, just send me in the chat box what country you think that's from, and I'll take a look at the answers as I'm talking. Uh, so this is some cheese I, I uh, took, and I think the the, the audience, uh, at least the shoppers around me, thought I was, I was rather peculiar taking pictures of cheese, uh, but we don't get a lot of uh, uh, cheese displays looking like that here in New Zealand. So things like milk composition, the, the kind of uh, way that's made called the make schedule, uh, the starter culture, secondary flora, things like smear ripening, the ripening conditions, very important. The obvious one is also the type of milk. Uh, partial separation of milk, if you're making Edam cheese, for example, it's a, a, about a one quarter reduction in fat content. So you start with slightly skimmed milk. Pasture quality, there's a lot of research done in Ireland and Switzerland to, to look at what do the cows eat and what, does, what impact does that have on the flavor profile of the cheese. Uh, the seasonality has, has a little bit of a, a, an effect. And if you're a big cheese manufacturer, that's something you want to eliminate because you're in the business of making cheese that's obviously safe, but, but also that is consistent in quality during the year. So the consumers don't get any surprises. Very much unlike the wine industry, I should say. The type of coagulant, as I mentioned, uh, chymosin from camels. Uh, there's uh, fermentation produced chymosin now. Um, and uh, of course, it's chymosin itself from calves and different kinds of microbial cultures, particularly one from, uh, uh, from uh, Mucor mihai. It's a protease found in that particular uh, cheese, which would, I, I guess, make vegetarian cheese. And uh, you can make cheese from a number of things, not just milk, but cream, skim milk, and whey, although it's open to debate whether whey cheese is actually a cheese, if you've ever tasted it. Uh, it reminds me of the smell of moldy carpet, I have to say, some of those whey cheeses. And also the pasteurization. Uh, heat treatment effect uh, that does have an impact upon the microbial population in milk and therefore has some uh, effect on the, on the flavor. So nobody has sent me any chats about where that, uh, where that bottom picture was taken based on the letters on the sign. So I shan't tell you. No, not Ireland. <laughs> Actually, sorry, that's not true, it was Ireland. Mystified, no, it's not a country. Greece, that was the one I was, I was looking for. No, it wasn't. It, that, that, that lettering there is, is Irish lettering before they adopted the Latin alphabet about 100, 100 years ago. Uh, so that's the way that uh, the Gaelic language was, was printed. So that's the same market as the picture up the top there. Right, uh, let's see if we can push on to the next slide. Uh, so cheese composition is, is rather, rather like the foundation of structure. You, you need to have the, the right composition to get the right structure. And that's some typical values there for cheese composition. Now, I, I'm sure most of you will know 
parameters such as fat in dry matter. And if you don't, there's a formula there. It's uh, the salt in moisture. And that, that's a very important measurement because it does give some indication about how the cultures are likely to grow in cheese over time and the moisture in the non-fat substance. And uh, you may think, why not just have salt rather than salty moisture as a parameter? And I, I, the answer there is that that's where the salt is. It's in the moisture. Where there's protein and where there's fat, there's no salt. So in effect, what you're doing is concentrating the salt up. So for example, in cheddar cheese there, where there's about 1.5% salt on a total cheese basis, when it's in the moisture, it's something like about 4.2%. And that's what you taste. So that 4.2%, that not the 1.5%. Uh, now, I won't uh, talk too much about that. There's a lot of detail there. If you get a copy of the slides afterwards on, as a PDF file, you may be able to look at that in some detail. And of course, the, the composition does vary quite considerably depending upon the type of cheese. And we've got baker's cheese from 0.6%. Uh, we've got uh, cream cheese, which is not there, but that has a, a much higher fat content. The moisture can vary considerably from uh, low points of something like um, 30 to 32 percent. Those would be the hardest cheese varieties you would probably find. Uh, and uh, the salt content also uh, is quite uh, considerable variation as well. Uh, and finally, the pH. And the pH is very important for dictating structure in cheese. And that varies from around about the coagulation point of caseins, the isoelectric point, which is around about 4.6, uh, sometimes slightly below that, well, sort of like yogurt pH, uh, all the way up to neutral. And if, if you wait long enough for cheeses like camembert, you'll start to get an ammonia smell when it's, when it's overripe. And that ammonia smell raises the pH above seven to sometimes as high as 7.5 to eight. And uh, that's one of the few foods that we consume that's not acidic. It has a pH higher than seven. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Icelandic shark meat is also another one and egg yolk. Oh, and also pretzels, forgot about that one. So what are the structural elements of cheese? So we'll take a look at the largest one to start with and that's the cheese crystals. And I will talk a briefly about that because sometimes you will, you will see uh, an older cheese that might be in the supermarket that has a white haze on the surface. And uh, that, that is uh, most likely not mold, although it could be, but it, in, in a lot of cases it's cheese crystals and uh, the, in particular calcium lactate. And that can form on the surface depending upon the ripening conditions. And of course, the supermarkets throw up their arms in horror and say, well, we've got to get rid of this. And they throw it in the bargain basement bin and sell it for less, which is the time that I swoop in and buy it because it's often very indicative of tasty cheese. Uh, very common on cheddar and, uh, and uh, gouda and, and, and uh, parmigiano reggiano. Uh, more common than other cheeses, I should say. Uh, so there's some crystals there. That one in particular one is a mineral called struvite and uh, they're often visible, particularly if they're more than 250 micrometers in size. The next size element is the fat globules, and I'll talk about that later in, in, the, in the next few slides. And they can range from 0.1 to 20 micrometers, and even larger in pizza cheese, where the fat globules coagulate, they rupture and coagulate and form large pools of fat, which has structural implications for pizza cheese. It helps it to melt more easily. Uh, it also creates a problem called oiling off when you heat pizza cheese. Uh, now, casein micelles are the next one, and there's a picture of those, uh, picture up the top, it's a scanning electron micrograph, it's kind of bumpy looking, that's what's called the kappa casein stabilizing layer on the outside, and down the bottom is a schematic, and uh, if, you, if you want to get into an argument with dairy scientists, the topic to pick is the structure of the casein micelle, and there have been whole conferences devoted to this, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, arguments have ensued, um, perhaps war is a better word than argument in some cases. So in the middle of that calcium phosphate, holding all the protein strands together is colloidal calcium phosphate, uh, given by these little black dots. Uh, and I'll just move them, the laser down here. You can see them pointing where the arrow is pointing. There's quite a few of them. Looks a bit like a plum pudding. And uh, that, that is, gives a meaning to the, to, the, to the purpose of the casein micelle. It, it uh, creates an environment where calcium phosphate, which is needed by the calf to be able to grow bones, is packaged in a way that it could be present in a liquid product. Otherwise, it'd be present as an insoluble mineral. 
And so we believe that that is the evolutionary purpose of the casein micelle is simply to package calcium phosphate in a soluble and easily available form for the calf, which of course creates cheese, which is um, what we eat it for. So looking at the fat content, depending on the variety of cheese, you will see different fat structures. The red, these are false colors, by the way, the red is, uh, if I move to the mozzarella, the red is protein fibers and the blue is the fat. Now, of course, that's not their natural color. And when you stretch mozzarella under heated conditions called the pasta flutter reaction, the protein fibers align, they cause the fat globules to rupture and coalesce, and they, they are found within channels within the protein fibers. Cheddar cheese, a little more irregular here, but of course, if you make cheddar cheese, you'll be aware that you're, you are pushing together or pressing curd particles at the end of the process. And that creates, uh, you'll see here this red area here that seems to be deficient in fat, the blue fat. And uh, that's the, the point where the curd particles fuse. And you'll see that under a microscope in this particular type of microscopy called confocal microscopy. Uh, cream cheese has a lot more fat, also has a lot of all these water channels, which is the black area. And processed cheese, very spherical. That's, a very, that's not natural cheese, of course, and that's creating basically a solid emulsion where the fat is now emulsified as fat globules, like it was originally found in milk, but different kind of structure. Uh, so look at the effect of homogenization. That's one way we can alter the structure of cheese. On the left is homogenized, and the in this case, the green is the protein and the red is the fat. And we've created much smaller fat globules than you will see on the right where it's non-homogenized. So on the non-homogenized one, you'll see B is pointing at a fat globule, and they tend to rattle around in those black cages, which is where the water channels are. Uh, the green is the protein again, and if you heat and stretch it, you'll get what's seen up here at point A, which is a coalescence of fat globules, which forms those sort of like lakes of oil, which are present within the pizza cheese structure. So that's one way we can alter structure by homogenizing milk. Uh, over time in mozzarella cheese, uh, first of all on the right here, we'll, we'll see those black channels I showed you before. Uh, this is what they look like under a, a scanning electron mic micrograph. And those little indentations you'll see here on the screen are where the fat globules push into the surface of the protein. And all you'll see here is a protein and everything else has been taken out. So it's kind of like a, the shell of a pizza cheese. Um, so here it is again up the top with A and over time the protein swells and imbibes the water which is found in these channels here. And it creates a more homogeneous structure. Uh, also, if you add salt, it creates a more homogeneous structure and much more quickly uh, than it would within the absence of salt. So another way to alter structure is to, is to uh, change the salt content. So what is tree structure? I, I think tree structure is, I like to think of it at the center of the universe. So everything sort of springs out of that. Uh, we'll start up the top here. Uh, the obvious uh, uh, thing that you will see is, is uh, that will, sorry, that, you, that you'll see is the appearance of the cheese will, di will differ if you change the structure. Uh, the texture will change, uh, that's fairly intuitive. Also the flavor changes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. The structure has implications for the digestibility and also the delivery of nutrients and therefore the health of the consumer. So depending upon the structure, a lot of work is done on this in, um, in the Ag Research and the Reddit Institute here in New Zealand and also in Canada at uh, Laval University and other places as well. On the release of nutrients and bioactive components when you consume cheese, and we're using vitro digestive models to break down the structure of different types of cheeses and see how does it release the nutrients. Uh, and also the food microenvironment and the safety is also dependent uh, on the structure and therefore the shelf life. So all these things sort of spring out of structure. Um, oh, there's a very important quote up the top there. Cheese with poor structure makes poorly flavored cheese, but good structure does not always result in good flavor. Good to know. So we need to get the structure right to get the to, to get the, the 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 good quality cheese. So how is it generated through structure? And uh, we have some structural elements here that are called macrostructure, and that is the surface bacteria on the Limburger. Uh, you'll see the blue veins within the Stilton, and you'll see the white mold on the surface of the Brita Mo. So these are things that are obviously visible, but are classed as structural elements. So this is how we can do it. The most obvious and easiest method is to use different types of culture to change the flavor. And that's what we've done for, for um, you know, 100 years or more. 
Another way is to homogenize the milk, as I showed you before. We can alter the moisture composition. We can also try a little trick by using recombined milk and put different coatings on the fat globules. So that requires homogenization as well. And I, I like that idea because um, it, it's a way of exporting dry dairy products overseas where overseas countries can add their own water and make cheese out of it. So we're not paying for the cost of the volume of shipping water overseas, or if you're air freighting it, the weight of the water. The problem with that is that recombined milk cheese tastes absolutely awful. Uh, so there are ways that, we're, and I've worked on this for a number of years to try and uh, develop cheese flavors by using different fat globule coatings. Uh, the, another very novel way is to alter non start lactic acid bacterial cell surface characteristics. So they bind to water, uh, not to water, to the fat globules, and therefore are able to react with the fat to produce lipid derived flavors. So I, I haven't seen that used in practice, but I have seen some foundational science that's uh, investigated that. So how do you get the nice flavor of Limburger? Uh, well, of course, an essential element is toe jam. And so you get three people to, uh, to stomp on the milk and that introduces the flavor. I can't hear you all laughing, unfortunately. I'm hoping you are not uh, writing that down. So methods to alter cheese manufacture, uh, those who make cheese will be familiar with all these uh, techniques. And it's basically by manipulating moisture through cineresis at the manufacturing stage. So I won't go through those in detail, but they are listed there for your uh, reading pleasure later on. Moisture control does prevent off flavor development. That, that's important to know through the growth of unwanted microorganisms along with pH and salt. And one that I haven't added there is ripening temperature. So all of these are very, very important. So if we can control the moisture, we can control uh, the structure to a certain degree and therefore impact upon the uh, control of off flavor development. So how is flavor generated in cheese? So of course, as a fermented product and the three main substrates for producing flavor, are casein, the triacylglycerides, which is basically the fat, and lactose, which is the, uh, the, the milk sugar. And I, I put lactose, well, it wasn't me, it was McSweeney and Sousa who did this in this diagram, but they, they put lactose and citrate together as carbohydrates. And a lactose is obviously very important for reducing the pH of milk to create acid, which has structural implications. And that is converted to lactic acid. If you look at Dutch style cheeses, they also have a citrate metabolism pathway and that creates those little eyes that you see in, in Gouda and also a buttery flavor that you get through a compound called diacetyl. So these are the substrates and then all of these uh, uh, in a very complex avalanche of biochemical reactions produce what we know as volatile flavor compounds down the bottom. Now, why do they need to be volatile? Uh, well, that helps us to sense it when we consume product because when you eat food, you have to chew it and your tongue moves around and there's air above that up into your nasal passages, which aids in the, the sensory perception of flavor and aroma. So note the important distinction here between flavor compounds, which are produced and we analyze that using biochemistry uh, sorry, the other way around. The volatile compounds, which we analyze by biochemistry and the flavor compounds, which we analyze by a sensory analysis, which involves human beings. They are, there are some, of course, important relationships between the two. So looking at caseins, a very important thing to note is if you get the wrong kind of protein breakdown in cheese, you get what are known as hydrophobic peptides. Uh, so if you use particular kinds of cultures, uh, or if you use a particular kind of coagulant that breaks down these peptides, uh, and it, uh, that can give a very bitter flavor to the cheese. So that's an important aspect to control bitterness in cheese by uh, manipulating the kind of cultures and coagulants. So looking at these uh, reactions here, um, you don't need to look at the details, but different kinds of biochemical pathways result in, in, in fruity flavors from, uh, from, from down this pathway here. Uh, different kinds of amino acids, which are sweet. And this is proline particularly important for the sweetness of Swiss cheese. Down here to the acids, which can have a number of different flavor profiles, depending upon what kind of acid. And uh, the one that I, my favorite is the sulfur compound. So you get cabbage, garlic, and cauliflower. Uh, 
which is absolutely anathema to American consumers. They, they do not like it at all, I've discovered, and they consider it a defect. But um, coming from Australia and, and, and now New Zealand, I do appreciate that that's, that sulfury note in some of the, 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 the cheddar cheeses that are produced. And then lipids again. So looking at the red, uh, the red uh, sensory terms, we get this uh, fruity, musty mushroom, uh, which is indicative of methyl ketones. That's a very important flavor component in blue cheese. Um, a number of uh, uh, lactone induced flavor components, the aldehydes up here, and, and finally the alcohols. So trying to elucidate what causes cheese flavor based on chemical analysis is an absolute haystack of a problem to investigate. And people have been uh, coming up with long, lengthy lists of compounds to, uh, to, to try and uh, figure out what's important. And then more importantly, how are they produced? What kind of biochemical pathways? And again, what kind of cultures produce those biochemical pathways? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, lipids. And this is a growing, a nascent fat globule. So it's being produced on the epith what's called the epithelial cell layer in the mammary cells. And it has a coating around it given by the arrows on that picture uh, right here. And uh, it's a very complicated uh, membrane. It protects the milk globule from lipolysis and coalescence. And it contains a lot of biofunctional properties. A huge amount of research going on now in the nutritional science to understand the health implications for some of these bioactives that are found on what's known as the milk fat globule membrane. Schematic diagram right here. This is what we think it looks like. Uh, this is from uh, a French scientist, Crisco Lopez. And uh, you'll see the triacylglycerol. That's the interior of the fat globule here. And what protects it, that very thin layer you saw on the previous slide is a tri-layer system. Uh, these are um, phospholipids, these orange with the two tails coming out of them. And the green ones here is finger myelin. And uh, um, I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Uh, between the finger myelin uh, fatty acid chains, which are the black lines coming out of all of these phospholipids, is cholesterol. And so that's where cholesterol is believed to sit in association with sphinger myelin. Also, you've got these uh, Christmas tree-like uh, things, which are uh, embedded proteins. Some of them are uh, transmembrane proteins. They go all the way through. Some of them, like xanthine oxidase, sit right here uh, between um, uh, this bilayer above it and the monolayer below it. Now, all of this is, is something like four to 10 nanometers thick. So quite complicated and has important implications for nutrient delivery. So the next slide, I'm going to circle the finger myelin and, and the cholesterol right here. So you might say, well, how do you know that's re real? Is that really based on reality? Um, yes, it is. There it is right there. Uh, so this is some work I did with a PhD student of mine, uh, Sophie Gallier. Uh, she now works on uh, for Dairy Goat Cooperative here in New Zealand, doing some, some really fundamental science on nutritional benefits of goat milk. Uh, this was, gosh, when was this? 11 years ago. Uh, so what I've circled there is a black circle, which is not really a hole. Uh, this is where the sphinger myelin cholesterol sits in a fat globule. So you can actually visualize where the chemicals found. That's a Jersey milk fat globule. It's around uh, seven, no, it actually is 17 micrometers in diameter. Uh, so Sophie took quite a long time to find that under the microscope. And uh, you'll see what's uh, attached to it, these little Mickey Mouse ears up here. Uh, that's basically the milk fat globule membrane layer without the fat in the middle. So they're sort of like, they're called empty vesicles. So why is this important? Well, this is where the cholesterol is. Now cholesterol has a bit of a bad rap. If I gave you a spoon of cholesterol and then I gave you a block of cheese that had exactly the same amount of cholesterol in it, one has a very different health outcome. Giving you pure cholesterol is going to have a detrimental health outcome. Giving you a block of cheese will not. And the reason for that is that the sphinger myelin binds to the cholesterol and it stops a lot of it from getting into your circulatory system. So nature has built a wonderful product called cheese where you can eat cholesterol and not get the detrimental health effects. And there's some clinical studies to back this up that show that uh, at, at worst, there's a neutral effect on, on cholesterol, on your blood lipids, a neutral effect at worst, but there are a lot of uh, slightly positive effects which are significant. 
good to know. So I've been promoting this for a while with the dairy industry because I think we need to uh, uh, talk more about the health aspects of, uh, of uh, dairy products. Of course, calcium is the obvious one that I won't be addressing here today. So that is uh, cholesterol. So you may ask, well, why don't we just take all the cholesterol out? Uh, we actually need cholesterol. If we don't eat cholesterol and we don't get it in our system, our body will manufacture it. We need that to create bile salts to digest lipids. And by putting cholesterol there, and this is a very re recent research coming out of uh, my own lab here in New Zealand that, that shows that if we have cholesterol present in these kind of fat globules, the more we have, the more it slows down the digestion. So it has a very important structural and nutritional role to play. So if you don't like that picture, uh, on the right-hand side there, we have a, a basketball and some tennis balls and some marbles. So that of course represents, and I'm sure you all know, the large basketball there is the fat globule, the marbles are the whey proteins in milk, and the tennis balls are the casein micelles. And not a bad analogy, by the way, because casein micelles are furry and so are tennis balls. So there we go, a sporting uh, analogy. So texture and flavor reactions impacted by a number of different things. Uh, it's extremely complicated to, to, to look at the, the, the different physical and chemical reactions that, that occur. One important one is the, the effect of milk fat globule extraction methods, which I'll address later on, uh, and how we take that out of buttermilk and use that to coat fat globules to make that recombined milk cheese that I talked about earlier. Things like uh, heating, cooling, churning, they have a profound effect on, on uh, structure and probably flavor as well. Homogenization certainly does. That, that's used in, in blue cheese to, uh, to amplify that uh, lipolytic flavor. And things like pulse electric field processing, which we've done a bit of work uh, with milk, but not with cheese. For enzymatic reactions, the enzymes that are naturally present in milk need to be close to what they react to. That's called the substrate. If they're not, there's no reaction. So that's fairly obvious that if we put the substrate and the enzymes together, we can get a desirable reaction or sometimes undesirable reaction. And of course that is dictated by a structure. Uh, and I will talk about the matrix protection effect uh, as well because the enzymes don't function as they should when they're in a cheese matrix or in a fat globule matrix. Um, I'm going to really skim through this quickly without going into too much detail. This is the uh, composition of the milk fat globule, mostly lipids, uh, a fair amount of uh, protein in there. And um, uh, all of these lipids have uh, um, different kinds of biofunctionality on this right-hand table, which is uh, dictated by, uh, uh, a lot of it's dictated by the, the, the kind of heat processes that we use to extract the buttermilk and create a powder out of it. Uh, I, I, now, this is uh, some very minor processing effects here. And as I mentioned before, they can have a profound effect on, uh, on lipid composition and also flavor generation. So this is some work that, uh, again, uh, Sophie Gallier did back uh, in 2010, looking at raw milk, recombined buttermilk and processed milk. And she was getting very different kinds of uh, of polar lipids, those are those orange circles with the two tails coming out that I showed you before. And that's going to create a, a different structure when you take those polar lipids and use it to re-emulsify milk fat to create uh, recombined fat globules. Uh, and also, this is uh, uh, analogous to the proteins. Uh, you'll see there that uh, we get different proteins coming out as well. Uh, now up the top here, this is alpha serum and beta serum, which are byproducts of butter manufacture and uh, buttermilk powder and buttermilk. One of the problems with buttermilk powder is that it, it uh, is, uh, has a lot of uh, very high microbial population of uh, potential spoilage autism. So it's given a high heat treatment to create the powder. And that unfortunately inactivates a lot of the enzymes that we want for biofunctionality. So we're looking at some non-thermal uh, less stringent drying processes to create buttermilk powder that retains that biofunctionality that we can use to then emulsify fat globules and recombine milk cheese. So how does fat create cheese flavor? Metabolized into the, the, uh, the fat itself could be metabolized into flavor um, compounds or precursors. The fat itself could harbor flavor compounds and precursors that are fat soluble. 
Uh, it contains enzymes in the milk fat globule membrane layer that produce flavor. And I pointed xanthine oxidase out earlier. Provides flavor precursors from the milk fat globule itself, or just has an oil or water interface, which is necessary for lipases to function to create lipid derived flavor compounds. So different kinds of theories, and nobody's really nailed this one down, which it is, but it's probably a combination of everything there. Lipases, of course, are enzymes. Enzymes like to be in water, but this lipase likes to react with fat. So that's why you need an interface. On the water side, you've got the enzyme. On the oil side, you've got the substrate. So that's, uh, that's a, few, uh, a few theories um, there. And uh, this, is, um, this is a micrograph uh, using false colors again. And, and it shows here that the bacterial cells, which are, I'm pointing at using the red laser pointer, they really like to be located around the fat. And uh, this is the fat is given by the red and you'll see that they're largely non-spherical, which probably indicates that this has been, uh, the fat globules have been ruptured and they've coalesced to, to create these unusual kind of structures. But the, these cultures like to, to, to be close to it. And there's some kind of binding mechanism that we're only just discovering between the, the cell, bacterial cell surface and also the surface of this, this pool of fat here. And uh, this is important for lipid derived flavors. If the, the cells which contain the lipases are not close to the, the lipids, then you won't get a reaction. So this is quite important to try and uh, to modify this kind of reaction, which is a, a manipulative technique to derive different kinds of, uh, different kinds of lipid derived flavors. So that's, that's an important point to know. Uh, so some more foundational work was done by one of my colleagues, um, uh, Rafael Jimenez Flores, which I used to work with him uh, over in California for a while. And uh, also John Sharp in the physics department over there in California. Oh, and uh, uh, Guyami from, from uh, Laval University as well. I don't know this guy, number two, a woman. Uh, so this is one, two, three. So what do we have here? This is called an optical tweezer. And looking at the right, the, the, these, uh, th this lab group looked at uh, binding of, of lactobacillus reuteri, which is given by the yellow circles, to the surface of the red fat globules. You'll see they're sticking here. And so it was of interest to these scientists to figure out how well do they stick. So what they did is they used optical tweezers and they took the milk fat globule and put it in what's known as an optical laser trap. And then they, the bacterium was attached to the cover slip of the microscope. And what they did is wait until it attached in, in point two here and drag the cover slip away. And the, the, that elongated right where my laser pointer is here, the bacterial cell until it finally popped off. And you can measure the force. And it's the binding force is, is not Newtons, it's piconewtons. It's 10 to the minus 12 newtons. So very, very small force, but it's important for that interaction between culture cells and uh, fat globules. And some very uh, interesting work done about 25 years ago, which I haven't seen that uh, using commercial practice or, or any kind of practice really, is to manipulate the, the, the surface characteristics of these non-stardalactic acid bacteria. So they bind more or less, depending on what flavor you want to the fat globule surface. So let's just push on here. Um, some very um, interesting work done in 1974. I uncovered this when I was doing my PhD, not in 1974, it was 20 years later, but uh, this was, um, a group from, uh, I think it was Ohio State University that uh, looked at um, a natural milk emulsion and made cheese out of it and looked at the, uh, the, the, the flavor response to see how cheddar-like it was. And the ripening period is given on the x-axis down here. For natural milk emulsions, it had pronounced, between moderate to pronounced cheddar flavor, which is good, that's what you want, right? So that indicates that the natural milk fat globules are important. By the way, if you make skim milk cheese and try and eat it, uh, as well as uh, some, some uh, very hard and uh, rubber-like texture, you'd also get very poor flavor. So that's another reason we know that milk fat is important for a cheddar cheese, and, and in fact, uh, all cheese varieties to varying extents. What they did is they took um, mineral oil, and they emulsified milk fat globule membrane material 
to create a recombined milk product and they got slight cheddar flavor. It's better than no cheddar flavor. So that was rather interesting. So that seemed to indicate that the natural milk fat globule membrane was important for flavor development, not necessarily the fat that was, it was coating, which in this case was just, a, just an odorless mineral oil. Quite interesting uh, uh, fundamental research back, uh, done back then. The reason it was only slight uh, cheddar flavor was probably because when they homogenized it, they added the milk fat globule membrane layer back in a mixed up format, not in its natural format. So the enzymes are all in the wrong place and they weren't creating the flavor that you'd expect with cheese. Uh, some work that we did 20 years ago, this was, um, uh, people here might know um, Chakrawidja Sundar, I don't know whether he's still working at, I think he's retired from CSIRO. Uh, Les Drury uh, and then uh, these two people here were um, collaborators of mine from uh, the University of Wisconsin in the US. And, and we looked at uh, the two things. One is the uh, uh, creating a recombined milk product with anhydrous milk fat, creating it with a solid milk fraction or creating it with uh, a liquid milk fraction. And when we had the liquid milk fraction, we saw an increase in some of these in the free fatty acids and also in some cases, some of the sulfur compounds, which is related in, 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 a, in a sort of a poor fashion to the development of cheddar cheese flavor. So that says two things. Uh, one is that um, perhaps it is the milk fat that's important uh, when it's in a liquid format. Perhaps the flavor compounds can get out more easily from the, the lower viscosity oil. But the other thing is that uh, it could be something to do with the circularity of the fat globules. Uh, this is some work that um, I have not published, but it was looking at globule circularity. One means it's perfectly circle, circular, like you saw in the processed cheese before. And as the fat globules get bigger, they get more deformed. And when they get more deformed, they expose more of the oil because there's not that membrane coating it anymore. So it, it, the hypothesis is that more non-circular and larger fat globules have a greater propensity for creating some kinds of lipid-derived cheese flavors. Uh, they're also more easily ruptured uh, as well uh, because they're larger. Uh, it's uh, a bit like filling up a bean, a bean bag with cooking oil and sitting on it, it ruptures quite easily. But if you try to do it with a, a very small circle that's only a millimeter in size, it's hard to rupture it. So this is some uh, work done all oh, 20, 25 years ago, looking at uh, this is what cheddar looks like. This is, I, I think, as far as I know, the, the, the first published confocal micrographs of, of cheese. Uh, back in, the work was done in 93, it was published in 95. And uh, it's got a lot, there's been a lot of improvements since, since then, as you've already seen in some of the previous slides. Uh, so uh, we can change the, 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 the circularity, we can change the size. Uh, in this case, we try to normalize the size across by coating the fat globules with different proteins, alpha S2 casein and alpha lactalbum. Just to look about what does it do to the structure? Uh, and interestingly, when we coat it with this particular casein right here, it creates a very, uh, uh, oily kind of cheese where the fat globules are easily ruptured and uh, we didn't taste the cheese, but um, uh, it, it's, it's just one way of manipulating the structure to create cheese. So these are enzymes that are found. I wanna talk about two xanthine oxidase and, um, uh, oops, I've highlighted the wrong one there. That should be a gamma glutamyl transferase I'll talk about, not, not the, the galactosyl. Uh, these are all found in the milk fat globule membrane on the surface. We also have enzymes found in the casein micelle and some in the serum phase as well. So I'm gonna talk about those uh, two enzymes. So xanthine oxidase, it's an enzyme that uh, has oxidative properties and it uh, has potential for development of flavor uh, by converting aldehydes that are derived from lipids into, uh, into acids. And uh, this is a, a reaction that it commonly catalyzes, the reaction of hypoxanthine to xanthine to uric acid. Uh, this enzyme is found in the milk fat globule membrane. Uh, uric acid, unfortunately, creates these very sharp, unpleasant crystals, which is what causes gout. Uh, and so people thought back in 100 years ago that if they homogenize milk, they might release the, the xanthine oxidase from the membrane surface create uric acid crystals and therefore create gout. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't borne out in, uh, in reality, that didn't happen. Uh, and so now we have a much safer milk product um, by pasteurization, 
and homogenization, uh, and it doesn't necessarily create uh, create gout. There's no mechanism to say this is important. Right, there we go. So this is the matrix effects I alluded to before. And, and what I want to show you is that uh, we, we get uh, uh, these two temperatures here. This is xanthine oxidase. If we pasteurize the mill, we get a large reduction in the, in the activity of that, um, uh, of that enzyme at 72 degrees for um, 15 seconds. So 15 seconds, we're not going to pasteurize for 30 minutes. 15 seconds is way up here. So we're not getting a, a large amount for the 72, but with the 63, which is thermization, uh, we typically do that at 30 minutes. So we've lost uh, quite a bit of the activity on the blue curve here, which says that um, high temperature short time pasteurization has much, much less of an effect on the activity of xanthine oxidase compared to thermization. Interesting if you're looking at uh, oxidized uh, flavor profiles in, in cheese. Uh, the matrix effect is, is where it's present uh, in buttermilk. Uh, we see a rapid drop off in activity as we heat it over five minutes. It's all gone by about 80 degrees. If we heat it at 65 and 75, uh, we see less of a drop off at 65, more of a drop off at, at 75. But when it's present in the buttermilk, when it's naturally on the surface of the fat globule, it has a matrix protection effect. So we see less drop off than we would uh, when it's in solution. Uh, so we looked at different techniques. This is just milk, so it's not cheese, but this is a reaction of aldehydes to acids. And if we do thermization or pasteurization, or if we even hold it at refrigeration temperature for a day, or if we add salt to it, I'm not sure why you would add salt to milk unless you're making Egyptian Domiati cheese. Uh, and uh, this is, um, milk is the blue, and this is a recombined milk product. And we see that uh, we can get some of that activity back of xanthine oxidase by making that uh, recombined milk product, but we might lose a bit if we just refrigerate it. Uh, here, we gain a little bit if we add salt to it. So it's very, very uh, uh, common processing technologies, perhaps with the exception of adding salt to milk, uh, can be used to manipulate enzymatic activity and therefore flavor production in, in, the, in the cheese that's made from that. So we looked at a number of, uh, of ways of changing flavor profiles. One that we examined was uh, washing. And we, we took a, a native fat globule here, and you'll see that the black circles around it, uh, that's the casein micelles. And uh, when we wash it, we, we lose the casein. And we've also washed it with what's called a simulated milk ultra filtrate or SMUF, which is basically the water phase of milk. And uh, you get a, a, a different kind of profile on the surface. So that basically changes the milk fat globule membrane using these very simple washing te techniques and therefore a way of manipulating flavor development that's derived from lipids. So uh, again, this is the emulsion. This is um, uh, the raw cream. Left is the emulsion and uh, orange is the cream. So we've done nothing to the cream here and we just created a recombined emulsion here. It's a little bit more activity in xanthine oxidase. Uh, here, if we wash it, we actually gain a lot of activity because we're removing some of the surface structures that are casein based. Uh, and we're getting more reaction, not because of the washing process here, but because uh, we're rearranging the surface on that recombined emulsion. Uh, and the same when we're washing it with uh, distilled uh, ionized water as well. So the important thing here is that when we homogenize to make recombined fat globules, we are altering the natural structure and therefore altering uh, some of the enzymatic activities. So the uh, second enzyme I want to talk about just with this one slide is glutamyl transferase activity. And again, uh, the same processes we used before. And this is an interesting enzyme because it produces what's known as a kokumi flavor in, in gouda cheese from what are called gamma glutamyl dipeptides. And uh, this, this enzyme, the glutamyl transferase is found in the natural milk fat globule membrane in a particular position. But if we homogenize it, then we're going to change its position and therefore change the production of these kokumi flavor uh, compounds. Uh, so this is uh, uh, known as one of the extra flavors. Uh, you're all familiar with the four tastes, uh, uh, salt, acid, sweet, and bitter. And, and here we have uh, an additional one, kokumi, and also umami, which is um, 
uh, sometimes not referred to as taste uh, taste um, parameters, but um, uh, more to do with uh, with flavor. So there we go. So in summary, cheese has a complex native microstructure that impacts upon appearance, texture, flavor, release of nutrients, and ultimately human health in, in a positive way. And we're only just beginning to explore that uh, and getting away from that uh, terrible dark period 20 odd years ago when fat had a bad, uh, uh, bad association with, with health and people were trying to get away from fat. And, and of course, doing things worse which was feeding people um, those old margarines from 50 years ago that were loaded with trans fatty acids. Fortunately, they don't do that anymore. And also making sure we eat lots of carbohydrates. So that's probably created the obesity epidemic rather than fat. That is my considered opinion. You may differ if you wish. So where are we now and where might we head in the future? So I think uh, that going back to that recombined milk, looking at low stringency extraction methods, low temperature to add value to buttermilk and buttermilk powders with retention of biofunctionality and as an application to improve the flavor of, of recombined milk cheese. Um, targeted functionality of cheese ing ingredients. We've done that for a long time with pizza cheese by altering the manufacturing process to get different stretchability, uh, to create less free oil, uh, and uh, uh, that's, that's, that's old research that we, we, we understand quite well. But what about health functionality? What about nutritional functionality? How can we change manufacturing processes? Really interesting one is uh, some work done by a colleague of mine. It was done well, 50, 40, 50 years ago in, in Ohio in the US, but it's been picked up more recently by some Irish researchers. Looking at manipulating redox potential, that's, that's basically the state of oxidation in the cheese matrix. And different cultures grow better or, or worse, depending upon that redox potential. So milk has a high redox potential in the positive range because it has a lot of oxidation because of the, uh, uh, when you milk it, you get ox oxygen being dissolved in the, in, the, in the milk when you milk the cows. But when you create cheese, it plummets into negative values. That's, that's a, a, a reductive environment and uh, important implications for the, the growth of non-starter lactic acid bacteria. So understanding that's important, even measuring it's important, it's quite difficult to measure it because we had so much oxygen surrounding us that contaminates the experiment. Understanding the impact of the cheese matrix on digestibility and the release of nutrient components. Uh, we use an in, in vitro approach here at the Ritter Institute on Ag Research. Uh, uh, some of my colleagues uh, do in vivo studies, which I think are definitely more time consuming and expensive and require all sorts of ethical approval. And then finally, uh, the one that I alluded to before, altering the surface characteristics of these non-starter cells to control binding to milk fat globules. So I think these, these are really novel areas that we can investigate further uh, uh, to, to look at how we can use, how we can manipulate manufacturing process and processes and therefore structure to impact upon flavor. Uh, in combination, of course, with the use of different cultures, which is uh, vitally important for creating flavor in cheese and probably the easiest way to do it, quite frankly. So when you're traveling, what three things do you need? Now, boys and girls, do not what I do what I do here when I was driving. Uh, I, I was uh, driving on the right-hand side of the road, which is fine. So I wound down the left window, which is fine because that's where the steering wheel is and took a picture. Um, I, you don't do that anymore. You get pulled over pretty quickly. So the three things you need when you travel, of course, is petrol, somewhere to sleep and cheese. So there is a, uh, a wonderful panoramic view of the city I now live in. That's downtown in the background there. And uh, that from the bridge to the city is two kilometers. It doesn't look it, but it's sort of like a, a zoomed in photograph, I think. And I think it was taken from around the area of Massey University uh, up on the hill. So I'm going to open up for uh, questions. And the, the deal is that if you type them in the chat box and I'm gonna read the question out, and uh, then I'm going to do it, attempt to, to answer it. Thanks so much, David. That was really excellent. I think um, everybody listening would realise what an authority David is on this um, cheese making business. In fact, I have heard that he has been nicknamed Dr. Cheese in the past. Yeah, there's a, there's a little club. We have the Dr. Cheese Club, a few of us who, who um, did our, our dissertations on cheese. So. <laughs> um, okay. 
Um, so questions, I have one question here from an anonymous source, not so anonymous. Can Australian cheesemakers create cheese that tastes like raw milk cheese using pasteurized milk? Absolutely. So I've changed my tune on this. Uh, decades ago, I thought, ah, the reason that French cheese is so great is because they don't pasteurize their milk. Not necessarily. Uh, there are ways to use uh, cultures and uh, ways to uh, purchase them from culture houses to get excellent flavored cheese. And uh, here in New Zealand, uh, we make, um, well, not we, I should, it's made by a Dutch family up near Auckland. Uh, it's called uh, Maya, uh, it's the name of their, their company. Now, you, you may think, well, uh, and that's with pasteurized milk. So uh, is, it, is it because they're using different cultures or is it because they're just Dutch? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe they just have this Dutch ore about them that creates beautiful gouda cheese. I have no idea. Uh, but we do tend in Australia and New Zealand and, and even more so in the United States to create cheeses that are safe, that are consistent, and there are no surprises to the consumer. And uh, I refer to those as the boring cheeses. Um, some of them are good, but um, um, so I'm always off to the markets trying to find uh, uh, cheeses that are made in, in a different way, maybe in a more artisanal way uh, that are not uh, so focused on consistency. And uh, those are springing up all over the place. We have a lot of those in, in New Zealand now. Some of you might know Neil Willman, who used to work in um, at Gilbert Chandler College. Uh, he's over here in New Zealand now. He, I think he's uh, fairly uh, heavily involved in the, uh, the Cheese Makers Association here and, the, and the, the National Cheese Awards that's held every year. So yes, we can. We just need to be more like winemakers and less like industrial cheesemakers. Okay, so I've got one more question here that I was thinking of. That was the question. I primed you with a question that I can't answer, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> what are some practical ways of altering cheese flavor development that cheesemakers here today could use in their factories? Right. Um, I, I would, I would, uh, hmm, that's, that's a hard one to answer. I, I, I talked about a few different processes like homogenization and, and homogenization is, is, it can create problems as, as well as creating different kinds of cheese flavors. I, I think the key here is, is to use different experimental techniques and, and try to use them maybe on a, on, a, on a softer scale than you would normally do. So maybe something like a low pressure homogenization may alter uh, the cheese flavor characteristics, probably the lipid derived ones, I would think more than the, the casein derived ones. Um, uh, experiment around with different ripening conditions, uh, different kinds of, of um, uh, barrier bags. Maybe don't use a barrier bag, maybe use uh, wax or, or some other uh, more oxygen permeable um, uh, wrapping on the cheese. Um, different ripening temperatures, that one's fraught with difficulty. It's, it's a bit like uh, predicting cheese flavor development. It's a bit like the weather. And it, it's known that if you ripen cheese at a, at a let's say about eight degrees Celsius, you, you can get the right rate of flavor development. If you take it to 13 degrees to try and speed it up a bit, it becomes a bit like unpredictable weather. You don't know what you're going to end up with later on. Um, so yes, there are, uh, uh, there are some different ways uh, you can, sorry, I'm reading a question out here, manipulate processing technologies. This is a question I've... Uh, Sorry, what are you reading out there? Which uh, I'm, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't multitask well. I've tried great from both sides of the okay. P word. I just wondered, Nicole, would you like to unmute and explain that? I find your question, your comment a little bit hard to follow there. Oh, sorry. Um, my point was probably better made earlier, and that is pasteurisation. Um, we can get bogged down in it. Uh, as a barometer of potential for quality. And I don't think it's an argument that we should be investing a, too much time in because what you've outlined in your presentation is probably more important to develop understanding of how substrates work with uh, bacterial and enzymatic propositions to create, you know, great tasting cheeses. Um, the pasteurization as opposed to pasteurization thing, like I said in my comment, wasn't really a question. Um, I've had brilliant raw milk cheeses and absolute crap. 
Um, so, you know, uh, the more we can talk about learning about what you just outlined in your presentation, I think the more quality and consistent quality we'll be seeing out of domestic cheese makers. That's yeah, I, my I, comment. I, I, do, I do tend to agree with you on the pasteurization. I, I think it, um, it, it's sort of the realm of the artisanal cheese makers and um, uh, some of them do not have very good practices. And, and when, you, uh, when our um, Ministry of Primary Industries points that out over here in New Zealand, they, they get very upset. Uh, and, um, but it, it, uh, I, 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 I've had excellent pasteurized milk cheeses and I've had, I've had some pretty awful raw milk cheeses. Uh, maybe that's what you were saying before. I don't. I, or I think you said the reverse. But it it, um, it it's it's like a cultural experience. If if I was in, if I was going to France, I, I would I would sample everything that I could taste there, and 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 form my own opinions about what is good cheese and what is not good cheese. And even that's a very difficult decision to make whether cheese is good or not. Sometimes it boils down to a personal preference or what. That's how totally well it subjective. Is. Or, but or I mean, I well went to is. I went to Bra a couple of years ago. And um, I had some diabolical experiences on both sides of the fence, but um, uh, I guess relating back to your content, for me, the importance as an artisan cheesemaker is understanding um, a lot more of, of, of what was in your presentation. And only with those fundamentals can we as domestic cheesemakers at artisan level improve. We don't have the benefit of schools aside from Castle Name, which has been brilliant. Uh, totally brilliant, but really only come to fruition in the last six to 12 months um, to further our cause in pursuing, you know, quality from a perspective of improving um, substrate and um, biochemical reactions with enzymes and whatnot um, with substrate and better practice. Fantastic. Yeah, there. I don't know what's available in Australia now. There, there was a cheese making school at Gilbert Channel, but that's closed right. down. It's not going now. Yeah. No, I think Alison and Yvonne um, provide a, 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 a great option for us. Um, but I guess my point is that we can get in a marketing and in a in a cheese maker chat context um, sidetracked by talking about raw pasteurization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a barometer for quality. Whereas we should be focusing on improving technique and milk sourcing and farming and that kind of stuff Absolutely. and your content has been um very insightful and helpful in that regard okay I um, ian field has made a comment there surely some of the taste and quality is to do with the quality of milk absolutely ian oh, and yes. we have run many webinars on that it's so important the quality of the milk um, now it is time to finish up. I've just clicked on a Mentimeter link there for people to give feedback. I'll also include that with the um, recording when that's sent through, but your feedback is really, really important. Um, thank you so much for today, David. It's been fantastic. And if anyone has got another um, follow-on idea for a webinar you'd like David to speak more about, um, that would be um, more than welcome if you send those ideas through to me. I just want, oh, sorry, Dave. One more. Thing, if, if you have any questions uh, about uh, anything, just, just flick me an email. I, the, the, the attendees have my email address? Yeah, well, always no. you can email me and I'll just put you in touch. Right. That's fine. Um, and I really want to point out that I was impressed with um, some of the researchers who you had um, cited there in your presentation, being Pat Pulaski and Raphael Humane Flores. And um, both of them have been our webinar presenters. And if anyone would like to hear any webinars from the past, they are being uploaded more and more onto the Dairy Australia website. But these ones, from current ones, won't be uploaded for another 12 months. But thank you, David. With that, I'll just stop the recording. Thank you. Mm -hmm.